mouth. But if you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning, it comes in Titus 2, verse 3 through 5. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips or enslaved to much wine, teaching what's good, so that they may encourage young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Again, Father, we come to you. And this is a joyful time, but it's also a a time for many that there is grief, God, that have lost their loved ones. And Father, give us comfort through your word and your presence. And thank you for giving your life for us. We love you. In your name we pray, amen. What starts us out with older women, and we're going to be talking about an older lady today. Her name was Elizabeth. Went through her whole life without having a child until the end of her life. She was barren all of her life. She was the mother of John the Baptist. But she was a righteous lady, and it didn't hinge even though her heart was broke that all of her friends were having children, and she couldn't. She stayed the course with God and kept her joy with the Lord. So if you're an older woman and you never had children, we can still be the example to be reverent in our behavior. And that reverence is towards God, our Savior, and our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can encourage young women to love their husbands and love their children. We can be that encouragement. So as this starts, Jesus said, In Matthew 11, verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there's not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, greatest prophet that ever lived. All the other prophets before him had only prophesied about the coming Messiah. John got to see Jesus. He paved the course. He was the forerunner before him to let people know he's coming. And he had the privilege of baptizing Jesus even. We're going to look at John's mother this morning. And the Bible tells us, can we have any light up here for me to see my paper at all? If it don't work, it's okay. And don't try not to put it on Blinderville. Oh, perfect. Don't touch a thing. It's great. We see the story of John's mother and father unfold in Luke 1, verse 5. It says, in the day of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. So Elizabeth's father, or her family, she came from Aaron, a priestly line, and her father, Zacharias, was a priest. So it was in their blood, which doesn't mean that you're going to raise your kids right. A child's got to make a decision for the Lord, just like everyone else. It says in the day of Herod, king of Judea. You know, I didn't realize this, but Herod was called Herod the Great. And he got that name because he was confirmed by the Roman Senate as the king of the Jews. And you begin to think about what really makes someone great. What makes a child grow up to be a great person? It's not their ancestry. It's whether they know Christ. This Herod the Great, the reason that he was after Christ as a little baby when he heard that there was this king of the Jews that was born and he went and killed all these children because he was threatened in his kingship. He wanted to destroy him. Said he wanted to worship him. But Elizabeth was barren. They're both old in their life. It says in the next verses, they both were righteous in the sight of God and they walked blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both advanced in years. Now, saying that they're both righteous as a mother and father didn't mean they're perfect. The only person that's ever walked this earth that was perfect and sinless was Jesus Christ. But they lived for God, and they wanted God to be their Savior. And even though their heart was broken because she was barren and they'd prayed all their life and all their marriage, they fixed their eyes on on God, and they remained true to their walk. When someone was barren back then, they were considered shameful or disgraced or even frowned upon divine disfavor from God. 
but they stayed the course and they loved the Lord and uh, they became obedient child of God all through their life. Well, the Bible tells us in the next verse, it happened while he was performing his priestly duty service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of his priestly office, he's chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now he was of the order and the division, it said in the first verses of Abijah. That was the priestly line where he was from. There was 24 of these lines. At this time, there was 20,000 priests. And they were broken down into 24 divisions. He was, Zacharias was of the eight divisions. Now stick with me here on this because this is pretty interesting. Each division had eight to nine hundred priests. Twice a year, they would each serve for a week to take care of the temple. They'd maintain the temple. They would teach the scriptures. But one of them each week was chosen to go in and burn incense. They would step into the holy place, not into the Holy of Holies, but in front of the curtain where the tabernacle was, and they would burn incense, offer prayers, and their prayers was for the people that there would become a redeemer, that the Messiah would come and redeem them. Well, guess who's chosen? Zacharias. Most priests, because there were so many, never had this honor. And if you ever were chosen, you'd never get chosen again for the rest of your life. So he had this honor, and he's going to be the one to go in. And the Bible says, in the next verses, the whole multitude of people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias is troubled when he saw him in the, the angel, and fear gripped him, so he's scared to death, frozen there. You've got to get this picture. All the people are outside. They're waiting for the smoke to come up from the incense, because that's where their prayers are being offered to God. And this angel appears to him. Now this angel is Gabriel, and you'll see that in a little bit. In the Bible, we know there's myriads and myriads of angels, but all through the whole Bible, there's only two named, Michael and Gabriel. Gabriel is the one that appeared to Zacharias. He's also the one here real soon is going to appear to a young lady named Mary. He's also the one 500 years earlier that appeared to a prophet named Daniel. So he's spellbound, fears gripping him, and he's troubled inside. And the angel speaks to him and says, don't be afraid, Zacharias, your petition's been heard. Your wife Elizabeth is going to bear you a son, and you're going to give him the name John, and you'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. You're going to be a daddy, John. Even though you're an old man and she's an old lady. Now, we don't know how old they were. The Bible just says they're old. This happened with Abraham and Sarah. If you remember, the Bible told us how old they were, but it doesn't tell us. It just says they're advanced in years. Now, he's in there making his petition or his prayer. Many said, as in the commentaries, he said he's probably praying for a child. I believe that might have been one of the prayers. But what he really was praying for was redemption for his people, forgiveness of their sins, the Messiah that had been promised for so long. And God heard his prayers. He didn't understand everything yet, but he gave him the name John. And the Bible says in the next verses, he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He's going to drink no wine or liquor, and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit while he's yet in his mother's womb. And he's going to turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. That was his whole job. That was his whole prophecy. Everything that he'd been praying about for this Messiah, he prayed in the right way. And he's going to turn people back to God. If you're a Christian here today, that's our mission, to turn people to God. God loves them. Now, it's interesting. John the Baptist is the only person ever in the Bible, ever recorded, that was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was still in his mother's womb, a baby in the womb. And the Bible says that he was. And it says that his he, John the Baptist, who's going to go as a forerunner before him, before Jesus, 
in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and their disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Thursday night at Celebrate Recovery, Imogene came to me. You all probably know Imogene. When I preached my first sermon, there was just three people. There was Imogene playing the piano, Rita, and me preaching. And I got ready to preach, and she said, Psst, hey kid, leading the music goes with the job. I said, no way. She said, get up there and start. I had to lead the music for a week, or no, for a month, and it wasn't pretty. But Imogene came to me Thursday night, now, there's a little bird out here. Don't worry about him. Somebody told me at church last week, there was a bird out there the whole time. Couldn't get my eyes off of him. Think about Jesus. <laughs> Think about Jesus. But she came to me and she said, Charlie, my cousin is at the nursing home in Eldon. He's on hospice and he's only going to live a few more days. He's dying. He's an atheist and he's never, ever wanted to talk about God. And she said, I was amazed. I asked him, would you please talk to my pastor? And he said, yeah. And she said, I couldn't believe it. Would you go? I said, yes. Friday, went up. How Imogene happened to be there. We went in. I sat down on the bed. It's down to probably 80 pounds, just skin and bones. And we began to talk about the Lord. And he listened and he invited Christ into his heart as his Savior and was baptized. Everything that our mission, that John's mission, you as a Christian, is to make people ready to meet the Lord. Now, it's not just to go to heaven. People are in a lost, dark place, and people need to know God loves them. God wants them to know he loves them. He wants to restore health to the families. There are so many broken families. He wants to bring unity back to the family. Now this verse, as this angel Gabriel talked to John's dad, this is the start of the New Testament. 400 years there had been silence from the close of the Old Testament. And the last verse of the Old Testament, I want to take us there. It's in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. The last thing, the last thing God had to say. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. God loves the family. Satan hates the family. This joy was not just about, I'm going to be a daddy. God, you're coming into our heart, and you want to do something in people's lives. Well, Zacharias looks Gabriel right in the eye, and it says in the next verse, he said, how am I going to know this for certain? Because I'm an old man, and my wife, she's old too. And the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to you to speak to you, to bring you this good news. You know, instead of good news, you could say gospel. That's what the word gospel means, good news. It's the greatest news of all times. But he had this doubt. Abraham and Sarah did too. They're old. They went through their whole life. How would you answer this prayer now at this time in our life? Well, there's always a consequence to us questioning God. I had this little story. I thought it was kind of cute. Rita brought it to me. I guess we're both getting old because uh, she brought this, and I said, well, I've told this now a time or two. Well, I didn't remember it. I said, well, if you forgot, probably everybody has. This guy's name's Fred. He's 32 years old, and he's still single. And he's, one day his friend asked, how come you're not married? Can't you find a woman who'll be a good wife? Fred replied, actually, I've found many women I wanted to marry, but when I bring them home to meet my parents, my mom don't care for them. She don't like them at all. His friend thinks for a moment and says, I got the perfect solution. Just find a girl who's just like your mom. A few months later, they meet again. His friend said, did you find the perfect girl? Did your mother like her? With a frown on his face, Fred answered, yeah, I found the perfect girl. She's just like my mom. 
you were right. My mother liked her actually a lot. Friend said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, my father doesn't care for her at all. <laughs> that was Rita's material. Not mine, I don't really like it. <laughs> well, anyway, how can I know this for certain? He's the angel. Well, the Bible says in the next verse, you're going to be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Now, it says he can't speak. We're going to find out a little bit later. He can not only not speak, he can't hear. And this goes on for some time. Now, I want you to understand, while this is happening, the whole crowd's outside. And they're waiting for him to come out. They don't know if he's died in there or what's going on. Because when the priest came out from burning the incense, the first thing they did was give a benediction. And that benediction was, let the Lord shine upon you. The face of the Lord shine upon you. His countenance be lifted up on you. Quoting of old scripture. He's not coming out. He can't speak. Well, the Bible says that the people in the next verses, they're waiting for Zacharias. And they're wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he come out, he's not able to speak to them. And they realized he'd seen a vision in the temple. So he kept making signs to them, and he remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. So he'd been in there. The week's service had ended, and he's gone back home. Now, what the Bible doesn't tell us, and what I've always wondered about, did Elizabeth know yet? He couldn't audibly speak, but he could have wrote it down. Was she in the crowd outside? I don't think so. Because the Bible says he went back home, and now the scripture goes right to her being pregnant. It says, after these days, his wife became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, this is the way the Lord's dealt with me in the days when he looked with me with favor upon me, to take away my disgrace among men. God loves me. And she knew it all along, and she'd lived a righteous life. But now there's a joy inside of her. And I can just imagine when, when Zacharias went and wrote down the news and gave it to her. But I wondered about that in green. Why did she keep herself in seclusion for five months? And there were several in the commentaries thoughts about that. One was she was afraid she was going to miscarry. Another was, well, she's older and there's going to be tons of people constantly knocking at the door wanting to see the miracle and she needed her rest. But the thought that I felt most closely fit, she wanted to be alone with God and to honor God and to praise God and to thank God and to, to just be alone with God with this little child in her womb. Well, the Bible says, now Gabriel's leaving and he's going and I'm just going to read it to you. You know this story and we're just going to hear a little bit of it. Gabriel goes in the sixth month. She's been in seclusion for five months. I don't want to go forward. I want to stay back there if we could. The Bible says that the angel said to Mary, comes to Mary, Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and you're going to bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus. And he's going to be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And Mary looked at Gabriel and said, How can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit has done this. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. And this child is going to be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Nothing's impossible to God. Nothing's impossible with God. And the Bible now says, Mary went to visit her. It should be the verse before that one. 39 through 40. If we could back up to that. At this time, after the angel Gabriel told her that, Mary went in haste 
in a hurry to the hill country, the city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Now, why did she go? You remember Mary, a word around town was, hey, Mary's pregnant. She's not married. Joseph even wanted to put her away secretly, and God sent an angel to communicate, no, this child is for me. But she went to stay with Elizabeth. And I wondered about that. I don't believe she was hiding at all. This angel told Mary that for a reason. Elizabeth's older. Mary's heart was, I want to come and I want to care for you through your pregnancy. And the Bible says in the next verses, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember John? He was filled with the Holy Spirit as soon as he was conceived in the womb. But now Elizabeth's filled with the Holy Spirit. And John's jumping for joy inside of Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth cries out, we see in the next verse, with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Think about this. This was Elizabeth's moment to be able to say, let me tell you what happened to me. I'm going to have a child. It wasn't nothing about her child. All of the focus went to the Savior. She never questioned Mary's pregnancy. There was no skepticism, only joy. She strengthened Mary's faith through her greeting. And the cool thing, there's no jealousy. You know, we can be jealous sometimes, even kids in sports. Somebody run faster than us in a track meet. Somebody run, did better in a basketball game. Somebody got a deacon and I didn't get a deacon. Somebody did something in church and I didn't get to do it. I heard this this week and they said the best cure for je jealousy is to rejoice with others. And there was a rejoicing. She sat, Elizabeth sat her son John down and began to teach him this trait. Remember something John said? Jesus has got to increase, I'm going to decrease. I'm not even fit to tie his sandals of his feet. Everything in Elizabeth's heart was centered towards this Savior. As much as she loved this little baby that was jumping in her womb. And you're the mother of my Lord. Only the Holy Spirit could reveal to us that this is the Messiah. This is the one that's going to take you, Elizabeth, to heaven one day. That in yellow... This Mother's Day, the greatest thing that we as mothers or fathers can pass on to our children is there's going to be a fulfillment of what God said. He's coming back. He's coming back to get us. And he loves us. He's going to take us to heaven one day. And after Mary said this, after Elizabeth said this, the Bible says Mary now speaks in the next verse. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Now you can read the rest at home. I didn't put the verses in. There's ten verses that follow. I know that I pronounced it wrong at early service, but it's called the Magnificat. Rita looked at me. I, I pronounced it wrong, but it's proclaiming God's greatness in these ten verses. It's 15 Old Testament quotes that Mary uses. And I believe in her home, in Mary's home, the one that Jesus grew up, Mary and Joseph were going over the Bible, and Jesus heard it growing up. And I believe John the Baptist heard it. You see what Mary said? My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirits rejoice in God my Savior. Nothing but humility. Mary needed a Savior. Even though she was chosen to be the Savior's mother, she needed a Savior because Mary was a sinner. The Bible says in the next verses, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months and then she returned to her house. That means now Elizabeth's nine months pregnant. 
And the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy towards her, and they're rejoicing with her. So now they're all coming, all of her friends and, and her neighbors, and they're rejoicing at this little baby that's filled with the Holy Spirit and is going to proclaim the Messiah. He's coming. Now Mary went back home, and she's pregnant with the Messiah. There was a lot of question in this. Mary stayed to help Elizabeth. Was she there when John was born? Well, the Bible says she stayed with her three months. She was six months when she went, and the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. We don't know by that. I believe probably she did stay until John was born, and then Mary went back. And the Bible says in the next verse, it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they're going to call him Zacharias after his dad. But his mother said, no, indeed, he's going to be called John. And they said to her, there's nobody among your relatives that's called by that name. Now see, Zacharias had written down what the angel had said. And Elizabeth was going to obey God. God had told Gabriel, I want his name to be John. He's going to be the person that's going to pave the way for Christ. Well, this whole time, Zacharias is still deaf and mute. He can't speak or hear. And the Bible says, and they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, his name is John, and they were all astonished. You see, he wasn't just mute, he was deaf also. Otherwise, they would have said to him, hey, what do you want him to be called? But he couldn't hear. So they had to write it down. His name's John, and they're all astonished. How would you know that? And now comes a question that I want us to think about. In the next verse, it said, Once his mouth was open, his tongue's loosed. He began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around him, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. If I would have been shut up for that long, couldn't speak and hear, the first thing on my mind would have been, what's the lawn look like? The cattle need fed? How much stuff I got to do? I got to probably go out and change the all on the mule. He... The first thing, I want to praise God. Everything's about praising God. I want to praise God for this gift. And a question comes from his friends. Luke 1, 66. It's our last verse in this segment. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, what's this child going to turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. For you as a parent... I don't care if you're a great-grandparent or just a grandparent or just a mother or father. The question God wants us to know, what's this child going to turn out to be? And our minds jump there. Are they going to be a professor? Are they going to be a mechanic? Are they going to be a lawyer? What are they going to do in this life? How are they going to succeed? That's nothing what this question was about. God asks us this question for you personally as well, regardless of your age, because you're a child of God. What are you going to turn out to be? Because the hand of the Lord is certainly with you. We look at that cross. When we survey that cross, we know, God, you're with me. Emmanuel's God with us. That's what Father's heart is. I want to restore health to the family, to turn the family back, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Well, you can read the rest of the story when you go home, but it's amazing now as Zacharias can speak, this benediction that they waited for when he was supposed to have come out and spoke, he gives it. It's called the Benedictus. It's 12 verses long, and it's about praising God. And in the middle of that, there's one verse I wanted us to hear. I didn't put it in there. It says, to John came to give his people the knowledge of salvation 
by the forgiveness of their sins. That's what this forerunner was about. That's what Christ was about. I want to close the day and read something to you. John, he barely lived to be 30 years old. This Herod the Great cut his head off. He didn't live much longer than Jesus. But he turned out to be what Jesus said, the greatest prophet that ever lived. But before he died, he's in prison and he's locked up. I want you to just hear these verses. The Bible says, when John was in prison, he heard of the works of Christ and he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one or should we look for somebody else? And Jesus answered and he said, Report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And he told the disciples that. And the disciples leave. And now the crowds are there. And this verse that we started with, I want you to see the last part of it. It's Matthew 11:11. 11, 11. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those of born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets because all the prophets only prophesied that there was going to be a Messiah. John got to see Jesus. He got to see him and he got to baptize him. But he didn't see him die on that cross and he didn't see that tomb empty. Now, when I used to look at the last of this, well, sure, the ones up in the kingdom of heaven, that's Gabriel and Michael. They're stronger and better than John the Baptist. He's not talking about that. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to us. And if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian here today, John the Baptist, while he got to see Jesus, he did not get to see the cross. And he did not get to see the empty tomb. He only foresaw that. But we know, we know that Christ died. We know the rest of the story. And when this question comes to us, God pierces through the skies, what's your children going to turn out to be? You want them to turn out to be one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. And it doesn't mean that they ever step to a pulpit or get on a boat as a missionary to Africa. But we've been given a job to help people know the truth. This is Holy Spirit revelation. Jesus said, truly I say to you, he's speaking to us today. Many people that celebrate recovery say, tell me, it's not the drugs or the alcohol or the pornography so much. I don't feel like I'm worth anything. I feel so dirty. God wants you to know today that there's a new start for you in your life and you are more valuable than any bird or any tree or anything that's ever lived on this earth. And he hung on that cross to restore fellowship and to take us to heaven one day. But he wants us to understand. And it's not to puff us up with pride. It's just to humble ourselves and be able to take the message. And Father, I thank you for every mother that's here, for giving your life for us. We'll never see this place called hell. Even though we sin, God, so much that we can't even count them. You saved us from that. You redeemed us. You died in our place, and we're thankful. But somebody today probably is like Imogene's cousin that's never met you. And Father, if they haven't, Help them not put that off because tomorrow may not come. And we love you and praise you, Lord. Thank you for dying for us and thank you for our mothers. Love you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you don't know Christ, it's darker today. Everybody can't see your face. That should make it easier. Don't put that off. You come. And if you need a church home and God's put it on your heart, you've been worshiping here. If you've asked him his will, then you come. And if you just need to pray, let's stand.